And let me just tie this all together. When I worked at FDA uh, for 11 years, I also spent time as a medical hospitalist on nights and weekends. So although I was a bureaucrat by day, I was a hospitalist by night. And one of the things that really hit home on how silent liver disease could be was, you know, I, I would get called down to the emergency room to do admissions. And I saw a number of women who were probably in their 60s, history of type 2 diabetes, on an oral medicine, coming in with signs and symptoms of cirrhosis. You know, no risk factors, nothing, you know, hep C negative, hep B, you know, nothing. And I started to notice that the oral agent they were on was a medicine called Resolin. And this happened again and again and again. And of course, I encouraged everybody to submit things to MedWatch. And the point of the story is not, you know, good medicine, bad medicine, but the fact that in most cases, the liver disease did not come, you know, to, to awareness of the patient or the healthcare system until it was end stage cirrhosis. And they started having, you know, varices with bleeding or coagulopathies or things like that. And so it really uh, brings us to the point now that, you know, we, uh, you know, we have a, an obesity epidemic. We have patients, you know, with being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes early in life. But in addition, we're having uh, an epidemic of liver disease. And one of the interesting things is as we now have treatments for hepatitis C, which are very effective treatments, which some call a cure, the number of people going to liver transplant for the hepatitis C indication is already starting to go down. And now the category of people going to liver transplant that's going up is NASH. So we can go to the next slide. Or do I have to do it myself? Even better. So what are, what are we talking about with NASH? Well, it's a spectrum. And so you, know, you have your normal liver and as you get fat deposited in the liver, you get, and of course, the, def, you know, the, the name, it's, it's non-alcoholic. It's always, you know, by definition, you never want to call something non. I mean, that's like when hep C was non-A, non-B, and eventually they figured out it was hep C. Hopefully someday we'll come up with better nomenclature, but this is what we have at this time. But you basically get fatty deposits, and so that's NAFL, or the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And when it becomes more extreme, because what you're looking at is not only fat deposits, but also inflammation, and of course it's the inflammation which then leads to the fibrosis, that's where we get NASH, the non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And NASH is becoming, and, and many are predicting that it's gonna be the number one reason for liver transplant in the US by the year 2020. And when you look at the Venn diagrams, there's a lot of overlap between people with NASH, type 2 diabetes. Um, so that's why I think it's really important to be aware. Uh, I think one of the things that we will be learning from the NASH trials is that we have this opportunity when we are doing diabetes studies, cardiovascular outcome studies and diabetes, we really should be following what's happening on the liver as well, because it would be uh, incredibly sad if we had a generation of type 2 diabetics who had improved control of their A1C, who then go on to liver cirrhosis and need for transplant or you know, their ultimate demise. And you know, I took these definitions from Wikipedia only because that's where you know, most patients get their information. And as I was alluding to previously, I mean, I think one of the important aspects that we all can do is to communicate this health information to the general public because I think you know, we're all in agreement that you know, a lot can be done to help improve uh, medical literacy uh, health awareness 
and with that greater ability to understand the health issues, there'll be greater support to actually fund research in those areas. So Anna Mae Deal, who was at Johns Hopkins, who was one of my attendings when I was a fellow there, and was also a neighbor, and was actually a model of, of what one should do. She would always be up at five in the morning running in the neighborhood, and, and uh, was always in great shape, and diet and exercise and all those good things. You know, they were one of the first uh, people to diagnose or to recognize the connection uh, between NASH and cryptogenic cirrhosis. And that was back in 2003. And uh, there has been a lot of work to try to make definitions. I mean, one of the frustrating things in this field is that the diagnosis, the definitive diagnosis, still falls on liver biopsy. And as you all know, there's a lot of reluctance uh, for people undergoing liver biopsy. You know, there are now options nowadays where you can go to an interventional radiologist and they can do a bi biopsy. There's some debate on whether or not that's as good as a more traditional liver biopsy. But the bottom line is we are going to have difficulty enrolling large-scale trials until we're able to validate or qualify surrogate or biomarkers, which get us away from having to do liver biopsy. Sort of analogous to what happened with hepatitis C, where we got to the point where we had a PCR RNA, uh, you know, the Roche diagnostic that actually went through the FDA PMA process. And once there was an approved diagnostic and the performance characteristics were, were well worked out, you know, that then became a surrogate marker, a biomarker, which could then, you know, lead to uh, the approval of therapeutics. So we have a long way to go in the, in the NASH space. And, you know, there is a guidance, you know, there is guidance out there on the design of endpoints for clinical trials in NASH. And one of the reasons why I put this slide up is because so many of the things on this list, you know, you would have on your list for diabetes trials. And so I think one of the points I'm going to try to make is that as people do diabetes trials, as people do aging trials, we need to have some sort of mechanism to assess their liver health so we can be intervening there as well, because I think overall healthy aging, uh, you know, don't, don't forget the liver. And so FDA and its wisdom, you know, since NASH is made up of, you know, the fatty, the fatty component, the inflammation component, the fibrotic component, they do have these sort of dual endpoints because they want to make sure that the therapeutic helps one and at least doesn't hurt the other. I mean, ideal, the ideal therapeutic would be one that, that decreases the fat, decreases the inflammation, and prevents the fibrosis, or even more amazing, reverses fibrosis. I think it's very unrealistic to think that any one therapeutic agent, any single agent, is going to be able to do that. But you want to make sure that if you're helping one, you're not hurting the other, which makes total sense. And then there is some interest in MRI-based assessment of the liver, and there's a lot of hope that that's actually going to have the sensitivity and specificity to be used at, you know, perhaps in phase two trials, because you would hate to have to do a year or two trial to figure out dose ranging. So if there was a way you could actually do dose ranging with an MRI-based assessment, you could then get the dose and maybe hedge your bets and take two doses into phase three uh, and, and, and de-risk your program. And then, of course, uh, some of these other secondary endpoints, quality of life, uh, and of course, the importance of quality of life. FDA has their big initiative with patient-focused drug development. But of course, the devil is in the details. 
and you know the the validity the qualification uh, for that specific population and that's FDA's favorite question It's like well yes it's been qualified in a similar population but what about this population so you know as you know there's a group specifically at FDA they used to be called the SEAL team but they're they're the ones that are sort of the keepers of of the patient reported outcomes so I wanted to just talk a little bit about FibroScan. And FibroScan is a ultrasound-based uh, test. And it's, and it's interesting, because when you go to conferences, people say, oh, well, FibroScan is a, a, a crummy test, or FibroScan is a bad test. And, and of course, if you look in the, the regulations, there's no such thing as a bad test. But you know, different tests have different characteristics. I mean, there's sensitivity, there's specificity, there's positive predictive value, there's negative predictive value. And, you know, is this test sensitive and specific? Well, you know, first of all, you know, why do we like ultrasound? Well, ultrasound is easy to do. There's a lot of patient acceptability and it's relatively cheap. It certainly is a lot less expensive than liver biopsy and, and it is less expensive than MRI based. But, but think about it, when you're monitoring someone for liver disease, you, what do you do? You check liver function tests, ALT, AST, bilirubin, alkaline phosphatase. When people have no liver disease, they have normal enzymes. When people have totally cirrhotic livers, they have normal liver enzymes. Uh, in the middle, it may go up and down, and it may go up and then you repeat it and it goes down again. We were talking about that the other day. So it's not a very sensitive marker for diagnosing or at least screening for. So what I would advocate is that, yes, I mean, this is a limited test. It's fairly primitive, but at least it has gone through the FDA device review process, and it is a 510K device that's been cleared. So it certainly is head and shoulders above, uh, you know, just a, a lab test. But the characteristics, the data that's coming out, if someone has cirrhosis and you do a fiber scan, you're going to pick it up. And you might pick it up earlier than you would have just based upon physical exam. If you get a normal test, then it may be normal, but they also might have some early disease. But what that means is the positive predictive value, if it's positive, it's really positive. It's just if it's negative, you're just not sure. But if you do the test and it's negative, you're no different than if you'd never done the test. And luckily, there aren't a lot of you know, problems with doing the test, and it's relatively inexpensive. So I would hope in the future, with some of these huge outcome trials for diabetes, and I mean, tens of thousands of patients have been enrolled in these outcome trials for diabetes. I don't know of any that had assessments of their liver. How many of those patients had NASH? How many of those patients were going on to cirrhosis? And it was sort of a missed opportunity because that controlled setting, and, and I would advocate if anybody uh, has access to those data, if they bank samples, and over time as we start to have biomarkers from the blood, and if you have baseline blood and then blood at the end of the study or if you're going to be doing a follow-up that could be an opportunity to leverage some of these studies that have already been done and be you know in and advance the field in the liver space because ultimately you know it's all the same patient so you know we're running short on time you know, fda has all these different programs to help facilitate things and we all hear about breakthrough and fast track I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Liver Forum. Uh, that's a public-private partnership. It's a group that has had a lot of involvement from FDA. The, uh, the Liver Forum that was at the recent liver meetings in Washington, D.C., actually had seven attendees from the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, the majority were from the GI division. Uh, there were a couple from the Center for Devices. And it was a wonderful opportunity to really talk, you know, hear their talks, but also talk to them during the breaks and get a better understanding of what they're looking for in the study of liver disease. And of course, many of the issues cut across, you know, liver disease, type 2 diabetes, uh, metabolic disease, uh, 
Not much discussion on aging yet, but that hopefully will, will come. And then, you know, they, they're, they're looking, they're very traditional, they want a persuasive phase three trial for the indication. And uh, folks will get copies of slides, correct? Yes, good. So, you know, these are just some of the ongoing trials. I would love to share phase three data, but there is no phase three data to share yet. Uh, so that time will tell. Uh, you know, they are using this surrogate endpoint for, uh, for the trial for an accelerated approval, and then they'll have outcome studies that have, you know, time to liver transplant, all-cause mortality, things like that. And I really see the future as combination therapy. And the whole idea is, you know, I know uh, some people are big supporters of metformin. I'm a supporter of metformin because the data I've seen is metformin does a really good job in removing the fat from the liver. So if somebody could be on metformin and then be on an experimental agent that's an antifibrotic, then you're dealing with all the various components. And, and I must confess, I'm actually on metformin myself. And back to yesterday's discussion, of course, you know, talking to Zan and others, I've been on it for a while. I don't have diabetes. I don't have pre-diabetes. My A1C doesn't qualify. But I talked to my primary care doctor and said, you know, there's a lot of unpublished data. And she said, fine, I'll put you on, I think, 500 once a day. So I've been on it. You know, I'm on a Blue Cross Blue Shield. It gets paid for off-label medicine, but, you know, a lot of medicine is. So, um, you know, if you've got the TAME trial. We also have the Harvey trial with an N of 1. And uh, I turned 60 in February. So we'll, we'll see how we do over, over the years. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll serve as my own control. And I will wrap up there. And I guess Stephanie needs a minute to get her slides up. And of course, nowadays we hear so much about digital health. The uh, Vita Health is a digital therapeutic and health coaching platform for wellness and chronic care. And we're going to hear about how those technologies are going to all help us do better uh, as we try to marry you know, therapeutics, diet, exercise, lifestyle in a way that uh, gets us to do things that we otherwise may not do, but that we know are good for us. So. I'm supposed to vamp as they're putting things together. I would encourage people to go to the FDA website because, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about FDA today, and there's amazingly amounts of guidance, and I enjoy the slide sets you know, uh, that they have on the FDA website because sometimes, you know, a slide from an FDA person provides so many more insights than a, a guidance document does. And uh, so I find those incredibly helpful. I would also encourage people when you're, when you're in the White Oak, Maryland area, to actually go to an FDA advisory committee meeting. You know, those are open to the public. Most of them now are in the great room at FDA. You know, there's free parking. It's a public facility. You know, the security is a little rough. But it's really amazing to be in the audience, to see the FDA in action, to see the back and forth between the sponsor, uh, the open public hearing where the public advocates come. Uh, it's really, it's, it's, it's really uh, uh, informative. And, and one of my roles nowadays, I, I work for the Global Liver Institute, which is a nonprofit 501c3 in Washington, D.C in advocating uh, for the patients who have liver disease, uh, serving as patient advocates for the FDA. Um, and it's very interesting how FDA does is starting to now incorporate the patient perspective much more than they ever did before. So I think all these different initiatives are helping FDA evolve. I think it's been a very positive step with Scott Gottlieb, who's the new FDA commissioner, given the fact that he was there before with Mark McClellan back when I was at FDA. And I think uh, we're heading in a very positive direction. So who knows, maybe someday 
uh, with a change in legislation or a change in mindset, we may have some indications that have the word aging in them. So we'll now go to Stephanie and digital health. 